This is Michael Moore, and this is Rumble. In seventh grade, I wrote an essay uh, asking uh, the question, why was it that in my lifetime and in the time just before I was born, we only killed Asians? The the question surrounded the fact that uh, after the German fascists were defeated in May of 1945, from that time on until when I was in seventh grade in the uh, late 60s, it seemed like any war we had, any killing we were going to do was going to be the killing of Asians. Starting with four months after Germany's defeat, we dropped the atomic bomb. There's some dispute as to whether or not the bomb was ready or sort of ready in order to drop it on Germany, but there was never any plan to drop it on Germany. It was dropped on Hiroshima. And then three days later, it was dropped again on Nagasaki in Japan. They were not going to drop it on Germany. Uh, Those are white people, and they felt like the American public would have a hard time with a mass slaughter of white civilians in Germany, but not in Japan. Five years after World War II, Uh, we found ourselves in the Korean War, fighting Koreans, killing Koreans. And that lasted for, I don't know, what was it, three, three plus years. And a few years later, we decided to uh, get involved in the Vietnam War quietly at first in the early 60s, late 50s, early 60s, but then full-blown with Lyndon Johnson in 1964-65. And we started killing Vietnamese. It just seemed to me as, as a, what was I then, 13 years old, just a little too easy to get it passed through to the American people that we could kill people that, well, didn't have white skin, people who were Asian. And I was thinking about that essay the other day because ever since then, ever since I was in seventh grade, we've only gone to war with people of color. I mean, just think about this, right? So after after Vietnam, and remember, at the end of Vietnam, of course, we were also in those final years, Um, invading and killing Cambodians, Asian, Laotians, Asian. And then along came Reagan. In the Reagan years, we invaded Grenada. After Grenada, Reagan bombed Libya, bombed a, a number of places, and also supported the Contras in Nicaragua to overthrow uh, the Sandinistas there. After Reagan came Bush the first, he invaded Panama. Then later in his first and only term, Bush the first uh, invaded Kuwait and then Iraq. You see where this is going, you know. And it continued on. It continued on to the Bush two, with the invasion of Afghanistan and of Iraq. This is just our way, and it became our way once the bomb was dropped in Hiroshima then generally the focus was on people of color. Violence. Death. This bothered me at the time. It always has bothered me. And when I had my newspaper in Flint, I often wrote about uh, this kind of violence, whether it was the police killing black citizens, whether It was the general racism that was involved, especially when it came to white people uh, murdering black people, brown people. And it continues to this day. And here we are in this awful week, this past week, of um, a mass murder of Asian women in the Atlanta area. I wrote about this kind of violence against Asians and Asian Americans 
some 34 years ago in a Sunday magazine piece for the Detroit Free Press. In June of 1982, a Chinese-American man by the name of Vincent Chin, 27 years old, was out with his buddies uh, in uh, Detroit, in Highland Park, for his bachelor party. He was going to marry his fiancée, Vicki Wong, the next day. So they were at the Fancy Pants Lounge. No judgment, please, folks. You know, it's um, where I'm from. And they were there watching the dancers and uh, enjoying their bachelor party. Sitting a couple rows behind them was a man by the name of Ronald Evans and his stepson, Michael Nitz. And they observed Vincent Chin giving a tip to, there were two dancers, a white dancer and a black dancer. And he gave it to the white dancer and not the black dancer. But it also meant that he had to essentially touch the white woman to give her the money. This seemed to upset Mr. Evans. And so he shouted out to Vincent Chin, Hey, hey, you motherfucker. And then shouted to the black dancer, We're so sorry. We're sorry. You know, you're a good, he doesn't know a good dancer when he sees one. And then Evans started calling him a little fucker and his friend Jimmy Choi was there with Vincent and uh, there were a couple other guys and he called them little fuckers. And, um, the, you know, the, <laughs> the basic racism of this referring to Chinese, Chinese Americans, Asian Americans, men as little and so Vincent Chin turns around, walks over to Ronald Evans and says, hey. And then Evans goes, hey, little fucker, big fucker, what's the difference? And at that point, uh, Vincent Chin hauled off uh, and uh, hit him for his racism. And Evans stands up and kind of a bit of a fight ensues Evans picks up his chair and misses swinging it at Vincent Chin and instead whacks his own stepson, cracks his head open. And the manager of the Fancy Pants throws them out onto Woodward Avenue and they they start, you know, yelling at each other out in the parking lot. Michael Nitz, Evans' stepson, goes to their car, opens the trunk, and pulls out a Louisville Slugger baseball bat. When Vincent Chin and his friends see this, they haul off, running running away. Running away down Woodward Avenue. Evan says, let's get, let's get in the car and go get these guys. And in fact, there was another guy in the parking lot, and they said, hey, we'll give you 20 bucks if you help us. And the guy got in the car with them. Drove around for about 10 minutes until they found Vincent Chin and his friends sitting outside the McDonald's there on Woodward, um, having a Big Mac and other munchies. Uh, they whip into the parking lot. Um, Evans hops out of the car while it's still moving because uh, he wants to go get these guys. And because the car is still sort of moving while it's parking, his stepson accidentally runs over Evans' foot. In fact, the car stays on his foot, the, the wheel, tire. And he's screaming at his stepson to back up. You're on my foot. So now, so now Evans has whacked his own stepson with a chair. The stepson has accidentally um, pulled up and parked the car on top of Evans's foot. So he backs the car off his foot. They get the baseball bat again, um, and uh, Evans runs after. Chin sees all this and his buddies, and they start to get up to run and. Vincent Chin runs out into the middle of the street. Immediately, Michael Nitz, the stepson, grabs him. And um, Ronald Evans cocks the baseball bat and fires away, rocks just just right at his legs, his knees. And this sends Vincent Chin down into the middle of the street. The next swing, smack, right across his chest. Vincent Chin's chest and breaks a number of ribs and but Evans isn't done he cocks the bat 
a third time, and this time right across his head, which then made Vincent Chen go limp and fall to the ground unconscious. While laying there unconscious, according to police reports, Evans kept beating him with the baseball bat. There were two off-duty police officers in the McDonald's, and they were watching this whole thing. They finally get up, put their food down, go out, and grab, you know, Evans and Nitz. And what are you doing? Uh, you know, they told him whatever they said to him, what this guy had said to them. Um, later, one of the dancers, the black dancer uh, there at the Fancy Bands, said she heard either Evans or Nitz say, uh, these are the guys that have cost us our jobs. Now, this you understand, this is 1982, Detroit, huge unemployment. I mean, really, 20, 30% unemployment, awful. And <clears throat> what auto workers uh, were told to believe, it was the Japanese that did this to them because people were buying Japanese cars. They were better cars, so Americans started buying them, and there you go. And so there was a lot of animosity and a lot of racism toward Asian Americans who were fearful at the time of people who had lost their jobs and were blaming Japanese, Koreans, Asians. And Vincent Chin died a couple days later in the hospital. And so Evans and Nitz were charged with the death. There was a trial. They were found guilty. And the judge... Um, instead of sentencing them for many years in prison, fined them $3,750. No jail time. Three years probation. That's it. That was the value of Vincent Chin's life. $3,750. Both of them paid, and that made it his life worth a total of $7,500. Uh, the U.S. Civil Rights Department and the Justice Department did charge him. They tried him for a civil rights violation, and he was sentenced to 25 years in prison. And that was overturned by the U.S. Court of Appeals, 6th District. So, no jail time, a $3,700 fine, and then finally a civil suit by the Chin family which resulted in what sounded like a good settlement at the time of $1.5 million, but the judge said that he could just pay that off at $200 a month, and only if he had a job. If he didn't have a job, he didn't have to pay anything on a particular month or year or whatever. So there you go. Uh, Eben said at the time that it wasn't a it wasn't a racist crime. It was not a hate crime. Nothing against the Chinese. He he uh, often went to a Chinese restaurant. The people there, he said, were very nice, and he was nice back to them. He didn't under he didn't understand what, even what the concept he said of what is it? What is the Asian American community? What does that mean even? Where I mean, where are they? I've never seen them. Where are these Asian Americans? He said. I live in East Detroit, which he wanted to point out um, was not the east side of Detroit, but East Detroit, more like, you know, another suburb of Detroit. After all this happened, I wanted to do a story on it, but I really wanted to talk to him. I wanted him to say the things that he really wanted to say, uh, things that he had held back on. And so after months of talking to him and his lawyer, um, I, uh, he agreed to talk to me and I, um, went there. I was surprised he did not have his lawyer present. It was just he and I sitting in his living room for an hour or two and he let loose. I was surprised at, uh, how bold he was, but then again, not. And, um, I wrote this up for the Detroit Free Press. Um, I've, I've included a link to it here on, on this platform, on this page. I have to warn you, though, it's, it's kind of like a, a copy from the, uh, 
the archives where they keep the microfilm <laughs> of old articles back in the day when they weren't digitized. But you can read it. It's it's uh, it's readable, probably re best on the phone, on your phone. Um, it's called The Wages of Death by me. Um, it appeared in August of uh, 1987 in the Detroit Free Press. And um, I really would love for you to read it. It's uh, it's Personally, it's one of my... I feel very strongly about this piece of writing. Of all the writing I've done in my life, this is a very important story. And I thought it was, back in the 1980s, very important to talk about how we see and view Asians and Asian Americans. And how is it that a white man could get away with murdering a Chinese American um, who was insulted by the racist comments and challenged the man for his racist comments and that man decided to first try to whack him over the head with a chair and then chase him down a big city boulevard uh, in uh, Highland Park, Detroit with a baseball bat and beat him to death and then not pay really any price for this this horrific crime the fact that we're having the same discussion now This is what, June of 82, when Vincent Chen was killed. That we're still talking about this some 39 years later. Well, it's no surprise if you're Asian American. You're, you're not listening to me right now going, I know, I can't believe that this is still happening. Of course it's still happening, just as it happens in various communities of color. If you're not the right color, you're not the right religion, you're not the right whatever. And that we would still, this is a week later and they still won't call it a hate crime. They're still on this kick of, they just happen to be Asian. <laughs> the same things I hear the police in Georgia and others saying now all these years later, the same things that the murderer of Vincent Chin told me in that interview in 1987. It's disheartening to me that to have it seem like there's been no progress and that when it comes to Asian Americans, it's now, it's thanks to Trump making it open season with all of his racist comments about the China flu, uh, the Kung flu, all the, all his, I don't even want to repeat them. All his racist comments that put the lives of Asian Americans in jeopardy for the past year. And they're not out of jeopardy. And they're living in fear right now. My guest today on Rumble is Annie Tan. And she knows this story that I've just told you very well. Annie was born in Chinatown and still lives in Chinatown in New York City. She went to Columbia University. She is now a public school teacher in the city of New York teaching special education. She's also a writer and an activist. I've read uh, some of the things. Uh, she's been uh, vocal and active, especially during uh, this most uh, recent time, uh, but also before that in terms of the racism directed from the what we call the former guy, the previous president, and how he knew how to light a match and create uh, acts of, of violence. Annie Tan is also the cousin of the late Vincent Chin. And so I'm extremely honored uh, to have Annie here with me today and very happy to welcome her to Rumble. Welcome, Annie. Thank you, Michael. It is such an honor to be here today. Well, it's... Um, I'm sorry we, we have to meet under these circumstances because, Correct. but then again, these circumstances just didn't happen last week. I just told the story of what happened to your cousin uh, back uh, in 1982. And, I, you know, so for you, this kind of violence, violence against Asians, Asian Americans, um, th this really isn't nothing new for you and your family. Um, and I I guess the first thing I wanted to ask you is just in terms of how you're how you're processing and how you're feeling about this most recent moment that we're in 
this rise of anti-Asian violence, especially over uh, the last year here during the pandemic, you know, how your fellow Americans have reacted and how it's being covered and discussed both in the media, on social media and, and elsewhere. If you don't mind, I, I just, because this has affected you and your family, your great aunt Lily was Vincent Chin's uh, mother who fought for justice on this issue for many years and uh, is no longer with us, sadly. Maybe just go ahead and take us into this with you as a member of the extended Chin family. Yeah, so I actually found out about the Vincent Chin case and my cousin um, kind of accidentally. You know, I was watching a PBS documentary of all things, uh, Becoming American, the Chinese Experience, and Vincent Chin's photo just showed up on the screen and my mom just went up and said, Go go hai le biu go. Uh, that's your cousin. And I was like, what? Um, and, you know, most of my extended family uh, are immigrants. A lot of them don't speak English. So I didn't really know how to ask um, many questions because, you know, I'm a kid of immigrants myself. And, you know, I just had all of these questions like, you know, are like growing up as a kid of immigrants in Chinatown, you know, you feel like you don't really belong in America. Like every TV show you watch, like Full House, you see all just all these white people, frankly, um, on television, and you don't really see yourself. So when I found out about Vincent, you know, it made me realize, wait, like my family's been here for decades and actually centuries. Um, I found out through a textbook of all things that I might be related to someone who worked on the Transcontinental Railroad back in the 1800s. Uh, and that... Uh, a great, 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 great grandfather of mine may have been pushed out of America. Um, and that's why my family just didn't want to move to America in the first place. Um, but mm. Lily Chin, Lily Chin did move anyways um, to America and hoped to have something good happen here, you know. And she faced racism too. And I found that out through uh, watching Who Killed Vincent Chin, a documentary. Uh, by Renee Tajima Pena and Christine Choi. And so I found out a lot of my family history through not my own family, but through research, um, because my family is still very much traumatized by the case. You know, as you know, um, my great auntie Lily Chin, she fought for years and years and didn't win. And what kind of yeah. message does that give us when, yeah. you know, you're sitting here and you're like, no, the. You know, it, it was an open and shut case. There were dozens of witnesses. You know, everyone knew these guys killed Vincent. And, you know, we just thought, okay, it's going to happen. These guys are going to go to jail. Even though we're talking abolition right now, you know, there's a whole nother conversation of what justice means, right? And Judge Kaufman was like, no, these are not the kinds of guys you send to jail. And it's exactly what happened last week with... Um, I don't even want to say the guy's name because his name is not the one that matters that killed eight people last week. Um, they're saying he just had a bad day and he's yeah. not the kind of guy that would do this. It's the same exact language, right? Said by guys that would totally, um, you know, brush these guys off. But then when it comes to Asian Americans, unfortunately, I learned that day that we have conditional citizenship. Like as long as we meet the conditions of what America wants from us, then we're okay. But as soon as, you know, we're perceived to have done something wrong, e.g. coronavirus or uh, fight being North Koreans or being an economic uh, threat to the United States, that's when really quickly we become a threat and we get attacked like this. And I've known that since, you know, as you said, you know, you introduced the case, you know, that's why Vincent was killed, because he was perceived to be a threat. Um, and it just makes me so mad. It's, it's infuriating, but it's really numbing because it's funny. I was looking back to a Twitter post of mine from May of last, you know, last spring. And I wrote in the thread about a friend of mine whose dad got beat in the legs during the pandemic, you know, and had to crawl to the bakery to call 911. And we've known this anti-Asian violence has been happening because of that conditional citizenship that I'm mentioning, right? Um, so as, as soon as we are seen and perceived as a threat, um, and I'm just 
talking at this very moment about East Asian people because, you know, we appear to be Chinese. I am Chinese personally, but, you know, other people appearing to be East Asian right now are getting attacked. Um, but this has been happening to all kinds of Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders. Um, and I think a huge reaction is that we have been seen as invisible through this whole damn crisis. And the fact that we're only getting any kind of recognition of anything happening right now because of the trauma that's happening to us is just inexcusable and infuriating. Like, Vincent's life didn't matter because he was killed. His life mattered because he mattered. And he will forever be known as a man who was murdered by two white guys because the white guys thought he was a threat. And I will forever know more about that case than who he was because the people, you know, who passed, like, and who knew him, like, aren't really here to tell me about him. Or, like, I can hear snippets from, like, his best friend Gary or just snippets from other people through his life, but... I'm never going to get to know Vincent. You know, he would have been 65 last May. Mm. Um, wow. Yeah. So it's it's really infuriating that, you know, Jay Caspian Kang said it best like a few years ago in an article that uh, the only thing really tying Asian Americans in a lot of ways is our trauma and the ways we are targeted. And that's not the kind of identity I want for us either. So like to just see people consoling me and asking me how I am because of the trauma and not asking me about my life either. Like, and that's also happening just across the nation for Asian Americans. We're all just reckoning with the idea that like, you only reached out cause something bad happened to my community. Like, where were you when like, you know, New Yorkers, like Asian Americans make up the poorest New Yorkers, right? And there are so many other issues that are happening with Asian Americans, like income inequality. Where were you then? So, um, I'm angry. I'm numb. I'm just, I'm just trying to process it all. Like literally right before this, like I just sat for an hour after teaching today and I just drank like an apple ginger seltzer and I just had to breathe and let my body like feel what it needed to feel because, you know, it's, it's, it's just been too much. It's, it's, it's uh, really heartbreaking uh, to hear any of this, uh, that you would have to feel any of this for what? What, or what? Yeah. Yeah. What? What's the crime here, folks? You know, it's it's like, um, and 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 to see, you know, it's interesting too. And I was noticing this. I mean, for the last year, uh, before this incident in Georgia, how many times that they that they showed Asians or Asian Americans um, being brutalized, acts of violence against them on, on television, and I'd say, I mean, I don't have a uh, a data on this but man it seemed like 60 70 80 percent of them were against women yes yes and that's that's the other issue right that um the media you know i it's it's interesting because i've gotten from a lot of women who are not asian women that no this was a crime against women yes it was a crime against women but it's because asian american women have been either deemed, you know, if you look at Anna Mae Wong, she was either the flower blossom Asian American female movie star, or she was the dragon lady. So either she's like the virginal, like cute, mm, like yeah. petite, like figure that can do no harm and will kill herself uh, if she doesn't have the love of a white man, or she's a dragon lady and she's deceiving and uh, she plots against uh, the white man. Like those are literally her all her movie roles, right? And that stereotype, you know, you see it through like Bai Ling, Lucy Liu, like a lot of what Asian American and I'm gonna say East Asian American women in particular have been reduced to in their roles um, over many, many, many decades, right? And so, you know, and and just looking, you know, as sex work industries and how many times have I been called exotic on in a bar or on the street, like. I was yelled at by someone who's like, hey, we would make beautiful mixed babies. And I was like, what? Like, and I just walked past like, and you know, I carry pepper spray. Like, I don't know if pepper spray is even legal in New York State. I did buy it at a gun shop in uh, Little Italy, um, the pepper spray. But uh, you know, I carry it around because <laughs> I know that people might like look at me as that meek Asian lady when they can't hear a word I'm saying. They don't know mm. me at all. Um, yeah. 
So it's first. Of, I yeah. just first. I had to process the words "gun shop" and "Little Italy." Uh, I didn't. Even, <laughs> I didn't. I didn't even know there was such a thing. I don't uh, know. I don't know if they sell guns. Actually, it's one of those like police, yeah. like friendly to police shops that like sell like you know the police vests and all those. And then they things. have a gun range in the basement or something like that. I have but, no uh, idea. I have never been down there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I probably would avoid it, but. But yes, of course, the pepper spray, of course, anything you need to defend yourself, because again, this didn't start with Trump. No. But, but boy, did he just want to get out the gasoline can and pour this on the fire, the fire yeah. of the racism that already existed. Right. And then just pour the gasoline on that. And let's just see what happens. Well, he knew what would happen. He called it China virus and Kung flu. And then he was like, no, no, but it is what it is. But you know, that that's again goes back to conditional citizenship. And it's also a danger to our national image of the United States as empire, right? And you covered it very well when you had your movie about empires and you go to Finland and they have a much better education system because guess what? People actually fund universal health care and child care and things that would have helped the United States get through this pandemic, actually, and would have made, for example, uh, people not be so mad at teachers for trying to do the right thing right now. Um, if we just had universal child care that wasn't so damn expensive um, and people being paid to stay home, right? But because our former guy, I'm going to use your words, former guy, he refused yeah. to help the people that just fomented this violence. Um, and, you know, it exacerbated it. It's not just been with the Asian American community either. Right. And, uh, you know, it's it's just so clear to us. But that that's what makes this the most maddening that we have been saying for months and months over a year at this point that people have been attacked. Like I've been verbally harassed, like my friends have been verbally harassed for like, be, you know, being the cause of the coronavirus. And the, on Saturday, there was a girl who was a, a Asian American woman uh, who was sitting on the train and some dude peed on her purse. On the subway oh, car. Jeez. It's so disgusting. We've been saying this has been happening like for so long, you know. Um, and I was honestly very worried about the coverage of this anti-Asian violence because, you know, copycats, like, they're, yeah. they'll step it up. That that was my worry. Like, yeah. if if people aren't there, like, being the figure, you know, and, and that's why I always tell Vincent Chin's story because... It was, it was not that like, you know, it, Vincent could have been anyone, but the reason why we know Vincent Chin's name today is because of my great auntie, Lily Chin, you know, and Helen Zia says it so damn well, um, that, you know, all these Asian American lawyers who are real estate people and non civil rights lawyers by any means, like, you know, they were all like, what should we do? And then Lily Chin stood there and was like, I'm going to get justice for my son. And so they all went and, you know, you were there. You you witnessed what happened. Like yeah. racial justice coalitions came together because Lily Chin was willing to stand up and fight back for it. But if it weren't Lily Chin driving this movement and being the face of it um, and go going all over, like we wouldn't know his name like this. We just wouldn't. But then not enough people know his name either. Right. And, you know, the, the thing that like made me really numb. Like I knew something like Atlanta was going to happen. Like I was just waiting for it. I was waiting for the text. From, and I found out actually from a black friend of mine who asked me like, Hey, Annie, like I'm checking in on you. Like if you want to talk about anything with Atlanta, I was like, what happened in Atlanta? And that's how I found out last week. Um, because you know, my BIPOC, you know, comrades have been checking in on me. Um, and my organizer friends, because I'm also organizing for safe school reopenings. Um, it's right. Yeah, it, it's it's the coalitions it's, of people, but it's also the people like who are willing to speak up that can make a movement happen. And I know that because of my great auntie. For the people who are listening, what can they do? What what should they? What recommendations? What suggestions uh, do you have? Because I think a lot of people want their voice heard in this, and and they don't want. Uh, Asian Americans to just have to uh, go this alone. Um, so, what what is what is it that you would tell people who are listening, who are you know not Asian American, but who are 
or white or black or brown or whatever. Just what's I think people want want to be supportive and want to fight this. Absolutely. Um, so one huge thing right now that's happening, and I'm really encouraged by it, is people are looking to Asian American studies and ethnic studies uh, to really look at what actually happened, right? Um, so this history, you know, what happened to Vincent Chin was not new even then, right? And that was almost 40 right. years ago. Like, right. you know, people, you know, going back to what Jay Caspian King said in 2016 about the Asian American identity being trauma, trauma, trauma. Like what I learned in my AP U.S. history class in high school was the Chinese Exclusion Act, Japanese internment, then the Vietnam War, which are all examples of trauma, 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 right? You don't hear about the um, the United, like the grape workers and how Asian Americans fought with that um, movement, right? And you don't see like, you know, just Asian American movements happening through history. You don't hear about um, the massacre that happened in Los Angeles in the 1800s that was the largest amount of, I think, Asian American workers that was ever killed in one moment. Um, but you also don't get to see like, you know, people don't know Anna Mae Wong's story, for instance. Um, but Asian American studies, uh, including the PBS documentary Asian Americans, which um, I was actually a part of, which I was very excited about um, in talking about my great auntie's legacy, um, would be a great place to just start learning about Asian American history. And also for my uh, Asian American like comrades, like we've also been put in a position where we are a so-called model minority. Right in 1965, when Lyndon B. Johnson opened up the immigration quotas, um, he re he only allowed basically upper class, educated, skilled workers into the country. So the image of Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders at that point coming into the nation uh, were these educated people uh, who could make an income and who could help America. Right. Um, and U.S. News and World Report and all those organizations like really push this idea that, you know, if Asian Americans can do it, why can't Latinx and black folk and indigenous folk, you know, I made them like, you know, it made it an oppression Olympics. So, you know, Asian Americans became a wedge and we cannot be a wedge anymore. We can't, we have to also as Asian Americans speak up, but know that like we've been placed in this position, like by big, bigger systems than us. Um, and that's why you see like all these positive stereotypes that very much helped me as a child, but didn't help my other classmates who weren't Asian. Um, there, there's a lot of systems in place. I, I, I know you right. know all of this. Um, but what I was going to say is that um, that Asian American studies is a very good place to start to learn this history. And then looking at uh, mutual aid organizations and organizations already doing this work. What are some of the organizations that people should uh, be in touch with? Yeah, so NAPAWF, N-A-P-A-W-F, is one of the own, one of the first organizations that specifically deals with uh, Asian American intersectionality with women and children. Um, and they've been doing a ton of work in Atlanta to support. Uh, Red Canary Song has... Uh, is an organization to support uh, sex workers um, in terms, you know, because a huge part of what happened in Atlanta is, you know, this stigmatization of what's perceived to be sex and body work, right? Um, and goes toward Asian American female stereotypes. Um, so a lot of uh, those organizations have been doing the work on the ground. Asian Americans Advancing Justice uh, in New York City, uh, there's CAV, Coalition Against Anti-Asian Violence, which is the old uh, acronym because they were founded as were many Asian American organizations after the Vincent Chin case. But there are all these organizations that are existing on the ground. And I'll, what I'll do is for people, yeah, for people who are listening, I'll, I'll put some links uh, to some of these groups here on my page uh, so that uh, you can uh, go there and see what it is that you can do to be a participant or to help in some way. I think it's it's really important. I did want to mention there are also tons of um, organizations that are giving direct aid to um, people during the pandemic and continue to. So like welcome to Chinatown, send Chinatown love. Those are New York City specific organizations, but they have been giving grants and support to restaurants and local businesses in Chinatown. 
uh, that had been directly impacted by the racism uh, with the coronavirus. Um, and there's, I will send you a long list of organizations uh, later, um, but know that people are doing the work on the ground. It is not all trauma, trauma, trauma. There are lives, you know, of people who are making our communities thrive. And I really, Mike, Michael, I don't want to talk to you about trauma ever again. I would love to meet you under better circumstances and talk about the awesome organizing we're doing, the, the work we're doing with students, like all this other stuff that we're doing. But unfortunately, this is still an issue. And it makes me very angry, but I'm glad to be able to support. No, I, I totally agree with you. And I was reading the other things that you've been doing you as a teacher and with the union and trying to get the schools open and open them safely. Um, and, uh, you know, you've, you have in your own way uh, been outspoken uh, before this. And, but I, I think to your point about the fear that exists within the Asian community in this country. Uh, it's, it's real. And, um, and the word needs to go out that yes, of course, everybody's afraid this could happen again. We're not known in, in the United States for just doing one-offs when it comes to violence, uh, discrimination, racism. No. So I think this is all very important. I was, I was just thinking how I was talking about this, the, the interview that the killer the murder of Vincent Chin gave me back in 1987, five years after the murder, he had refused to talk to anybody in the press. I worked on him for months to let, let, let me come over and, and talk to me. And I spent two hours in his living room. And one of the things that he really wanted to stress to me, and when I think of this now, this is like 40, 30 some years ago, how we're listening to the same line again right now. He s started complaining to me how white people are the victims, how we're soon to be the minority in this country. And wow. what, what then, what then? And he just, and he, then he went off on how I know Detroit's in the name of our town, East Detroit. It's no longer called East Detroit. Now I think it's called East point or whatever they, the, it's a, it's essentially a white suburb. They hated having, <laughs> to be associated with Detroit. He says to me, there's only three black families here. <laughs> wow. Wow. You know, and there aren't any Asians. So how, wow. he says, how could I become a racist when there aren't any races around me? And right. I was like, so anyway, I could just, he just kept on and on with all this stuff. But the really, the thing that just rings true to this day is what is it with white people? that this that th this this claimed fear of the others the hordes have have moved in and we're going to lose our america to them and you know i said to him you know you know we, you know unless you are african american or native american we're all we're all the children of immigrants you know and and most of our ancestors came here under pretty awful uh, conditions um but i guess that's lost now it's been many generations for a lot of white families but but it was it the the, the fact that that white sheriff that captain baker stood there and tried to explain away how this mass murder was just having a bad day and he was at the end of his rope and um you know it's it was just his addiction and wow i just thought boy have you ever heard a press conference by a police officer talking about anybody of color where they would try to explain away something that just happened, you know, and try to have compassion f for them? Of course, this wasn't compassion. This was just him continuing the racist tropes. And I just, it just, I don't, I don't, you know, I'm a white person. So I've had to go say through this last week with my own feelings about it and trying to figure out what I can do, uh, you know, with my own privilege to try and stop this. Um, but it isn't going to go away on its own. No. I actually, uh, that's why I told the story of learning about Vincent Chin uh, for The Moth. Uh, it's on The Moth Radio Hour if you want to just look up my name. Oh, that's, Moth. yes, I listened to it. It's excellent. And I will also put a link to that, everybody listening, on my on my page here. Yeah, and I think, it's really important to like humanize it. Like 
I think I tried to really celebrate that life as much as I could um, and that legacy. And I think it's not that we don't, of course we acknowledge what the hell happened, right? But I don't, I don't want people to be like, my condolences, Annie, all the damn time. Like, we're living lives. And until you materially make our lives better, including for my immigrant parents and my immigrant Chinatown in terms of language access, how many of us have, you know, how many of the generations of kids who know English have had to figure out vaccine appointments, for instance? Like, you can't say you actually care about Asian American lives if you're not translating vaccine appointments for our elders who can't figure out an email. Right. So it's if you actually cared, then you would actually ask on the ground, what is the need right now, um, which you are doing. I know I really appreciate you for doing. Um, and that really needs to be happening. Um, and to go back to Ronald Ebens, like he didn't see Vincent as human. He just didn't like just based on everything you said, he cared much less about my cousin's life than his own, for instance. Um, and right, you know, and. Like he's he's still running around, you know. Helen Zia told me that like they will chase him, and you know they will always find where he is, you know, because he still owes my family like millions of dollars based on those civil fees. Oh yeah, fees. no, he hardly paid anything on on the judgment. A judgment he agreed to, by the way, right. to avoid trial. So he agreed to the judgment, and um, and he laughed. Five years later, he had paid nothing on the one point five million that he was supposed to pay the family, and he just said. Yeah, it, well, the 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 clause says uh, unless I have a job, so it's been real easy to avoid paying this because I don't have a job, and uh, oh, I fi- he, he I said, didn't I, know that. Yeah, he said I figure I figured um, you know by the time I'm 572, uh, the, the, uh, maybe I can pay it off by then. He just was laughing at the at the whole the whole thing uh, and knew that he'd gotten away with murder literally, and. Um, and yes, he is. Uh, he is still alive. I believe he lives in Nevada. Um, he's tried to have the suit dismissed, the judgment he agreed to. That hasn't happened. Um, and Helen Zia, if you don't, people, if you don't know who she is, a great writer, and uh, covers this and many other issues. Uh, I used to publish her in my in my newspaper uh, back in Flint, and um, so uh, check out her work too. But. Uh, uh, you know, Annie. I just, I think. Um, first of all, I'm just, I'm sorry that that uh, your parents, uh, your grandparents, your great aunt, uh, everybody. I'm sorry we didn't get to know Vincent Chin. Uh, everything I've read and everybody I've talked to back in the day, his friends who were there the night of his murder, uh, just said he was a great guy. He was a funny guy. He was an engineer. He was very smart. He was very um, uh, a, a giving person. Um, the, the, when the news reached his mother that this is she couldn't believe it that that this is like the last person you would expect to end up dead in the middle of woodward avenue in, in detroit michigan and it's just uh uh but i've never forgotten the story i've never forgotten the killer as i sat there with him for two hours and um he it if you i'm not going to get into it now but he just if you read the story um i i do my best to describe uh, the kind of person he he was, and um, I, I just don't want to see this happen anymore. No, and, uh, and then and then you know, with the Black Lives Matter movement and just talks of what abolition and justice look like, I think there also really needs to be a conversation of what justice is, right? Like, you know, it's so you know the daughter of Judge Kaufman, who was a POW. Uh, in I think the Korean War and may have had like a perception mm. of Asian Americans that was not yeah. great because of his experience. Wow. You I know his know that. yeah yeah his daughter said that you know this was what he did for Ronald Ebens and Michael Nitz was possibly like a chance of restorative justice. You know as he said these aren't the kind of men you send to jail and he didn't want to send them to jail. But like you know did anyone ask what my great auntie wanted like what justice meant for her um, and what justice like there, you know, I've been hearing about like um, cases where like young uh, non-Asian people like beat up, you know, they were young teenagers and they beat up an Asian elder. And uh, I forget who did it. It was a lawyer in New York and I'll find you the name. Uh, but she talked to both sides and 
the person who got beat up just asked that those teens never do it again. And so the lawyers worked with the teenagers on actual like anti-racist, not like the top down anti-racist stuff or just reading a book, anti-racist books, whatever, but like real programs to like probably Asian American and ethnic studies were in there. Right. And the teenagers, like apparently, according to this lawyer said, um, they understood now and that they would never do that again because they understood what, you know, Asian American history was and the humanity in this person. Right. And I, I think, you know, and that person was good. With, the one who was beat up um, was good with what happened. And they all agreed, like, you know, these uh, teenagers felt very remorseful at the end. Um, and so that's not to say that's what should have happened in the Vincent Chin case at all. Um, and I don't know what justice looks like because my great auntie Lily Chin is no longer here. And my family's here. But, you know, a lot of us didn't know Vincent either because... A lot of us moved to America after Vincent was murdered. Um, but it, it does take into account that there is a much larger conversation that needs to be happening in this country. But also gun control. Like, why are we having so many guns like this? Like, that allow these kinds of murders to happen in the first place, which you have talked about extensively since Bowling for Columbine and before that. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of conversations that still need to happen about what a society is and how we actually treat each other and be with each other um, that I really am looking forward to actually having those conversations without a like, you know, a like, let's get a hate crimes task force where they're going to be really punitive. I don't know if that is the right thing to do either, because the people might come out and not be remorseful or understand what the hell they did in the first place. That might be going on a big tangent, but I really wanted to make that point clear that like we really have to reimagine right now how we treat each other and who we mm. are to each other. Yes. So true. It's so true. And listen, I do have an optimism in me that that we can be a better people. And post-pandemic, yes. we can create a new normal of how we're going to treat each other, how we're going to live together um, with each other. So I want to I want to hold out uh, for that. There's a great article by Rachel Cohen that came out a week or two ago in the New York Times that lists all of these things that we thought were never possible. For example, rent moratoriums, like. Things that yeah. are, and turning on the water for people who can't pay utilities. Yeah, like how it, about that? Yeah. So like, there are things that are totally possible now that were not possible before the pandemic. And we do need to look at those things and know that um, it is possible to treat people correctly. I mean, that's why I'm a teacher. So like the next generation of students don't act as terribly as other people have in the past. Yes. How long have you been a teacher? Uh, I'm in my ninth year teaching right now. Wow. Wow. In New York City. Mm -hmm. I, yeah. I taught previously in Chicago, but yeah, nine years. Yeah. You're in New York now. Yes. Born and raised and loving my city. Yes. Well, hey, Annie, thank you so much uh, for sharing all this uh, with us. And thank you for the work you're doing right now uh, to uh, fight back against this and, and to create a better world uh, locally, around the country, around the planet. It's all... It's all on our shoulders. We, all, we have no choice but to do this, as far Correct. as I'm concerned. And, um, and I, I want to I believe, too, that uh, the, the, to anybody who's listening to this in uh, Detroit and in Michigan um, and who knew your cousin, Vincent Chen, um, to think that all these years later, some 39 years after his murder, that he would be remembered, that he didn't die in vain, that movements, be, movements, real, as you said, movements began after his murder and, um, and continue to this day. And now there's even more people involved to stand up against this hate and this racism and, and in his name. And I wanted, to, I wanted to acknowledge him and everyone else connected to him, be it family or those who stood up for him, that the work continues and we can succeed. I truly believe this. I think we're capable of it. So, Annie, thank you so much. Annie Tan uh, has been my guest here on uh, Rumble. Uh, she is a New York City public school teacher and the cousin of the late Vincent Chin. Thank you. Thank you so much, Michael. It's been a pleasure. Be sure and check out all the organizations that Annie mentioned and uh, my article uh, in the interview I did uh, back in the 1980s. 
uh, with the man who murdered Vincent Chen uh, right here on my uh, podcast uh, platform. Uh, the links are, are all here. Before we go any further, I want to thank our wonderful underwriter, Amazon Studios, and their must-see, and I mean this, must-see documentary film. It's called Time, and it was directed by Garrett Bradley. Time, man, this is a powerful film. It's the most honored documentary of the year, and it was just nominated for the Academy Awards for Best Documentary Feature, the Academy Awards that are coming up at the end of April. It's also been nominated for Best Documentary by the Independent Spirit Awards and for Outstanding Producer of a Documentary by the Producers Guild of America. So it's, it's had numerous nominations, numerous awards already granted uh, to it. I mean, just, just listen to the list of awards that Time has already won. Uh, Doc NYC, Sundance Film Festival, the Gotham Awards, the IDA Documentary Awards, the New York Film Critics, the LA Film Critics, the National Society of Film Critics. Okay, you're getting the gist of this, right? I mean, there's a reason why I and others are so high on this film and why everybody is buzzing about it. Garrett has accomplished something, I have to say, is so profound. She's made both a beautiful love story, but also a powerful film about America's cruel and racist prison industrial complex. The film tells the story of a woman named Fox Rich, who has spent the last two decades campaigning for the release of her husband, Rob G. Rich, who is serving a 60-year prison sentence for a robbery that they both committed in the early 1990s in a moment of desperation. Bradley, the director, paints a mesmerizing portrait of the resilience and radical love necessary to prevail over the endless separations caused by this country's mass incarceration epidemic. So, do yourself a favor, my friends. Watch Time on Prime. And if you don't have a Prime membership, do a free trial just to watch this film. Sign up for the free trial, watch this movie, and I'll have a link to this film in the description page right here for this episode. Again, I want to thank Amazon Studios for supporting this podcast, for supporting my voice, and supporting the work of talented filmmakers like Garrett Bradley and her excellent film, Time. Also, I want to thank another one of our longtime underwriters of this podcast. This underwriter, you know them, Gabby, G-A-B-I. This is the company that helps you save money when dealing with the vultures, yes, I said it, and bastards, uh, oh, there, I really said it now, in the insurance industry. See, now I'm just being redundant. I could have just said insurance industry, and you already would have known that they're, it's vultures and bastards. My friends, everyone is looking for ways to save a few extra bucks right now during this time we're in. Well, how'd you like to keep an extra $961 in your pocket? This is what Gabby does, and this is how much the average Gabby customer saves because Gabby, they're on a mission to reduce everybody's insurance payments, especially during this time. Your car insurance, your home insurance, all you have to do is link your current insurance account, and in just minutes, you'll be able to see quotes for the exact same coverage that you currently have. And I can tell you, the majority of you are going to be shocked at how much you're overpaying right now. And I know I've already heard. I've heard from friends. I've heard from people listening to this podcast. They've written me and told me how much they've saved from Gabby. So, my friends, see how much Gabby can save you. It's totally free to check them out, and there's no obligation. Just go to Gabby, G-A-B-I, dot com, and then don't forget, slash Rumble. Thank you, everybody, for supporting this company, Gabby, which supports me in my work. Gabby.com slash rumble. So today, in case you've been keeping track of my quarantine, my year-long lockdown, self-imposed, uh, well, I blame the virus mostly for it, so I don't know how self-imposed it was. Uh, but today is day 379, and this is the day that I'm being let free. I 
uh, am ending the lockdown today because this is now today, four weeks ago. Today, I got my second shot, and they said they give it three weeks before it you know takes full effect. I said so for me that means like four weeks, <laughs> just to, it's got it's got a you know a ways to travel, but it's four weeks since the second shot today, and so I am going to venture out and see what has happened to the world that I used to know. Uh, I have only left this apartment building three times in these 379 days, twice to get the shot, uh, to get the vaccine, and a, a third time I had, back in December I had an infected tooth, uh, and you can't mess with that, uh, anything like that in your, in your mouth, your teeth. So I had to go to an oral surgeon on a weekend day, uh, and uh, he had to pull the tooth. And uh, so uh, that took a little while to heal, but that's it. That's the, those are my trips out. Um, and I'm so happy to, I don't know what I'm going to do. Frankly, I know I've, I've sort of talked about, well, what will I do on that day? I think some of you have probably already gone through this or you're about to go through it because you're getting your shots. Uh, if you've been in any kind of lockdown, and especially if you live alone like I do, it's... Uh, uh, literally uh, have been um, uh, not around humans. And so I've, I've thought for some time, what will I do on this day that I am released from this building? As I've mentioned, I, you know, the one thing I've learned is that I'd make a very good person under house arrest. Uh, so I know now I can get through that if that ever happens. But, but, but seriously, I, um, I have a whole bunch of ideas and I don't know what I'm going to do. And I thought, don't make a plan. Don't make reservations at some wherever just go so that's what i'm going to do I get up and i'm going to leave uh the building and i'll i'll take my phone with me and i'll record my uh, feelings and maybe take some pictures maybe i'll do a facebook live i don't know what i'm going to do i just decided to leave it that way i could just go to the airport and get on a plane with a one-way ticket next time you hear from me i'll, I'll be on one of the i'll be on one of the continents <laughs> whichever one will let the plane land. I don't know. I don't know what it is, but I have to say that um, I feel very lucky and blessed that I'm still alive. I think those of us who are still alive feel that way. I feel extremely sad for the people that didn't make it through, for those who did make it but are still sick, who are getting you know recurrences of being sick, there's still a lot we don't know about this about this virus, and we don't know what will happen. That's why, even vaccinated, I've just decided I'm going to play it safe. I'm not going to do anything crazy today. I'm going to continue to wear my mask, keep my social distance, wash my hands, wear my glasses. You know, just, we don't know this virus. And we're all kind of part of a grand experiment here with the virus now. Uh, we now know the virus doesn't kill us, so that's good news. And it looks like it's having quite uh, an impact, which is also good news. And yet, we have states like Michigan that have tripled the number of cases in the last month or so, COVID cases. And this is happening in other states, too. There's surges that are happening around the world. So we're, we're not through this. But I have been very careful and I have been inside for these 379 days. You know, I can I count myself amongst the lucky ones. And then we'll just see. I'll, I'll, I'll try to record on some level here today when I'm out and about. And, um, and maybe I will do a podcast <laughs> while I'm out there. I'll put together the pieces of a podcast. So the next time you hear my podcast, um, maybe, I don't know. I don't want to promise anything uh, to check with our editors and whatever but maybe by thursday night maybe um uh you'll get my first podcast uh post lockdown so we'll see um but thank you for being part of this uh for this last year or so um and as you know i'm extremely grateful to all of you for being part of it i've had a lot of time to think about what to do what to do with my work what to do politically here post lockdown and um and so 
I want to talk about that in the next few weeks. I want to make sure that all of you are on my mailing list. Uh, so there'll be a link here on my podcast page. Uh, if you are, if you don't get emails from me, please sign up, be on my email list so I can communicate directly with you as to what uh, the upcoming plans are. So go to the description page of my podcast here, Rumble, Rumble with Michael Moore, and there will be a link uh, to sign up on my email list. And that way you'll you'll get the latest news as to what uh, what I'm going to be up to here. So as I look around the podcast studio here that we built in my uh, empty bedroom, <laughs> I don't know what I'm going to do. I'm just going to, I got to get out of here. Uh, it's been good. I'm not complaining, but uh, but it's time to see what's going on out there. I'd love it if you join me uh, in in virtually. I mean, please don't don't show up at the, at the apartment building. Uh, I'm, I, I'm 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 good to go by myself. Um, in fact, I think that's all I could handle right now. So uh, I will I will report back to you as to what happens. And if I end up doing a Facebook Live or something, if you're on my Facebook, uh, maybe you'll have a chance to to see that. All right, my friends, this is it. Much ahead of us, much work to do. I'm so appreciative of uh, all of you and appreciative of the support and the love um, and for caring about all the other people we share this planet with. It means a lot to me. I will talk to you very soon. And now it's time to fly the coop to rumble my way out of this building. Take care, my friends. We'll talk soon, later this week. This is Rumble, and I am the soon-to-be-free Michael Moore.